Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Lapel. I am a legislative policy analyst with Denver City Council. I have the pleasure of working with all 13 council members, so I work in central staff. And we're here tonight to talk about redistricting um, and redrawing our council district boundaries. I also just want to take a moment to let my colleagues Kathy and Doug introduce themselves and Sam from the Community Language Cooperative as well. So Kathy, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Kathy Zern, and I am here today to show you how to use Maptitude Online for redistricting. I'm part of Technology Services with the City and County of Denver, and I'm looking forward to tonight. Hi, I'm Doug Genzer. I'm with Technology Services also with the City and County of Denver, the Data and Analytics team, and I'm here to answer any questions you have after Kathy's demo. Hello everyone, my name is Sam Guzman and I'm here with the Community Language Co-op and uh, the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice. Now what that means is we want to create a space where everyone can participate and engage in the language that they feel more comfortable. With. We will use the simultaneous interpretation feature in Zoom to create this space. When I finish saying the same statement in Spanish, we will turn on the interpretation feature and you will see a global icon at the bottom of your screen. It says interpretation, go ahead and click on it and then select your preferred language. In this case, either English or Spanish. When you do select your language, make sure you also check mute original audio so you don't hear both languages at the same time. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Samuel Guzmán. Estoy aquí con Community Language Co-op. Estamos aquí para crear un espacio donde practicamos la justicia del lenguaje. Lo que eso significa es que queremos crear un espacio donde todos pueden participar en el idioma en que se sientan más cómodos. Usaremos la interpretación simultánea de Zoom para crear este espacio. Cuando termine de decir esto, activaremos la interpretación y verá un icono de globo en su pantalla que dice interpretación. Lo va a pedir que seleccione ese icono y de ahí seleccione su idioma preferido. Cuando seleccione su idioma preferido, en este caso inglés o español, puede seleccionar silenciar audio original para que no escuche ambos idiomas a la misma vez. Ok, we're going to... Go ahead and turn on the feature. You will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and select the preferred language. Thank you. Okay, well, hopefully that works. Um, thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight to learn about redistricting and how to use Maptitude, which is the tool we'll be using to draw our council district boundaries for this uh, redistricting effort. But before we do the Maptitude demo and show you some other cool tools that Kathy and Doug have created for you all, I just wanted to do a brief overview of what redistricting is in Denver and what we've done so far. So I'm gonna lean on Kathy and Doug here. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So what is redistricting? Every 10 years, Denver City Council is required to redraw its council district boundaries based on the most recent US Census data. Our charter outlines certain rules that we are required to adhere to while we are doing redistricting. Our charter is our city's constitution, and the rules are relatively simple. We have to divide our city into 11 districts. Our districts have to have as equal population as possible. They have to be as compact as possible, contain contiguous territory, meaning you can't have like a neighborhood from far southeast Denver in District 11, which is far northeast Denver, and they have to be comprised of whole voting election precincts. Um, so a lot of you might have noticed if you've lived here for quite a while, Denver's changed quite a bit over the last 10 years. Our population has grown by about 22% um, and is around 715,000 people. This map is great. Um, thank you, Kathy and Doug, for producing it. And I know it's quite tiny, but it's also available on our website. Um, but you can see in this column our 2010 population and in this column our 2020 population. And then in the third column, the change, the plus or minus. Every council district from, has grown from 2010. This next map demonstrates where that growth has occurred a little more clearly. So the darker the red, the more growth has occurred. And this gray area is where the least amount of growth has occurred. So as we start looking at 
maps and drawing council district boundaries, you know, you have to take this growth into consideration when you're thinking about creating council districts that are of equal population and density. A lot of things that we've talked about um, in council is our focus on race and equity. So we wanted to include this slide to just kind of address the displacement of our communities of color that has occurred over the last 10 years. So the map on the left demonstrates racial group plurality from 2010, and the map on the right demonstrates racial group plurality in 2020. The green is um, Hispanic or Latino neighborhoods. Um, white is, or sorry, uh, the salmon color is white, and yellow is um, Black or African American. And as you can see, um, our you know African American populations have decreased over time. Um, especially in District 9 and District 8 in the Montbello and uh, Northeast Park Hill area. Um, and you can see that some growth has occurred in District 8 and 11 in our Hispanic and Latino population as well. So what have we done so far with redistricting? I, a lot of you I see who have registered, I know you're very involved in the city and in what we do. Um, so hopefully this isn't the first time you've heard about redistricting and what we've done. Um, so we've had a three-phase approach thus far in community engagement. Phase one, we hosted a mapping drive with representable.org, which is a um, organization out of Princeton University that was created to combat uh, gerrymandering. And so we use this tool to create uh, maps of communities of interest. And we had incredible participation in this. Um, and we've received over 150 maps. So we use this data to create a data layer that we'll be using in Maptitude, uh, which is super cool. So you can see the, your initial work being put into action in this latter phase of redistricting. Phase two, uh, we worked with TS to create a census dashboard. And so if you go to our redistricting website, you can see um, census data and how it's changed over time from 2000 to 2010 to 2020. You can view this data on a neighborhood level or on a council district level. And now we're into phase three where we're asking you to draw maps um, with all the council district boundaries um, to provide and provide input um, on council submitted maps as well using Maptitude, which is a great tool. And Kathy will show you that. Um, and then we'll also be using this time, which is Q1 2022 to vet maps. Um, so we'll be having a series of community meetings throughout the month of February and March, where we'll be asking you to provide input on the top maps that come out of the committee, the redistricting committee that is convening on Monday, January 10th at 1.30 p.m. So a lot of questions that I've seen in our redistricting email inbox is how can I get involved? Um, thank you so much for coming here and being here tonight to learn about this tool. Um, but these are a couple of other ways that you can get involved. You can submit a map on Maptitude, uh, which is really easy, but it's quite tricky because the math is really challenging. Uh, you can attend our six community meetings. As you're aware, there is a surge in COVID. So our initial plan is to have them in person around the city, but just stay tuned and we'll might pivot and have it all virtual. Talk to your council members. Uh, so, you know, if you have an ally on council, it might be worth talking to them about what your community priorities are. Um, and, you know, everybody has three council members. You have your district representative and two at-large members as well. And then submit comments to our designated inbox at redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. I check that email multiple times a day, so you should be heard and responded to. And another thing we've worked on is making resources available for all of you. So we have a website dedicated to redistricting that has resources on not just our processes, but peer city processes um, and great tools that you can use to guide conversations in your community. Um, we have Maptitude for redistricting, which is a free tool for you all to use that's also translated into five different languages. Our meeting in a box, uh, which is a one hour meeting with curated activities that you can use to uh, you know, talk through important topics within your community and with your neighbors, such as how do you define community? How do you um, view your community geographically? 
And then again, we have our redistricting 2022 uh, at denvergov.org email address. So that's my quick little summary of what we've done. I see some questions in the chat and Q&A, and we'll address those after Kathy has done her demo. Um, but I'm going to go on mute and Kathy, take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, it says that you disabled participant screen sharing. I need to share my screen. <laughs> you should be good to go now. Thanks for that. Okay, me. let me try that. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you so much. So before I get started with the training, I would just like to review the fact that the Maptitude for Redistricting software does require the collection of something called Personally Identifiable Information, or PII, in order to submit a plan. It, when you go to submit a plan, it will ask for your name, your address, and your phone number, and you have to fill in this information in order to submit a plan. So we want you to know that this information will only be used for redistricting purposes, and all copies of this PII data provided to council will be destroyed by April 1st, 2022, at the end of the redistricting process. City Council might use this information to verify that you live in the city and county of Denver, or if they have questions about a plan that you've submitted. If you decide that you do not wish to provide this information, but you still wanna participate in the redistricting process, we would encourage you to contact your city council representative at the email that Emily described earlier, and it's on the screen right here, redistricting2022 at denvergov.org, or you can attend a public meeting to share your thoughts on redistricting. So there's more information on the redistricting website about how we're going to use the PII and how it's used within Maptitude. So now let's get right to the software. This is the landing page for Maptitude Online for Redistricting. One of the first things I'd like to point out is that this website is multilingual. You can change the language on the website across the bottom here, or up here you can use the drop down and you have English, Spanish, Portuguese, Vietnamese, Korean, or Chinese, and Mandarin. You also have this tips tool that you can click on, and the tips just walks you around the screen and tells you a little bit about each control on the screen. I'm gonna go into a lot more detail today, but I would encourage you to go ahead and use that tips. There's also this help screen. Help is very helpful. Not, it's not all the time that help is, is helpful in some software, but in this case, help is very helpful. So this quick start guide walks you through creating a Maptitude online for redistricting account, creating a new plan, modifying the districts in the plan, all the way through verifying and submitting your plan with screenshots the entire, throughout the entire guide. To get rid of that, you just click the help again because it takes up a lot of the screen. There's also this contact button. If you click on contact, you see that email that Emily mentioned, redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. If you have any questions about the software, you can feel free to send your questions there. So the first thing that you'll do when you get to this web page is you need to create an account. So you will click on new user. So when you click on new user, you need to create an account because the software is set up so that you can go back in and you can save your plans and you can come back to them. You can have multiple plans and it's not just a one and done thing. You'll be able to come back and build new plans. So they require a username that has to be five characters, a password that needs to be at least eight characters. You enter your email address and then you get a link sent to your user email address to activate the account. Sometimes the email takes a few minutes to show up in your inbox. They want to know you're not a robot, and then you click Create User. I already have an account, so I'm going to go ahead and click on Existing User, and I'm going to log in. So the very first time you log in, this box right here showing My Plans, that will be empty. 
but this plan manager box pops up all of the time. I've been in and out of this application, so I have a couple of plans saved. And here's where you manage your plans. I can open up either one of these plans, I can make a copy of it, or I can delete plans. But again, the very first time that you open this up, this will be blank and you'll wanna click on new plan. And here's where you choose the starting point for your new plan. The starting point you will use to create your plan is called Denver Districts. So you select it and click Create. And then you can give your new plan a name. I'm just gonna call this one Demo and click OK. OK. So when this opens up, every time you open up a plan, you are shown this extent of the map. This is the city and county of Denver. And you can see the orange on the map. These are the district outlines, the district boundaries based on the new precincts. And you can see that each district is labeled with a district number, District 1, District 9, District 8, for example, District 5. And below that, there is a percentage. And what that percentage is, is the percent deviation from that target population. The target population is 65,047. Throughout the application, you'll see that it is called ideal value. So for example, District 8 has a, a population currently that's 12.5% above the target population, whereas District 3 has a population that is 13.9% below the target population. So every time you open up a plan, by default, there's two windows that are open. So there's this window here, and I can't see behind it. <laughs> All I see are, Emily, can is there a way for me to get rid of, hold on, uh, I just need to get rid of, there we go, okay, sorry. So there's a couple of windows that are open by default every time you open up a plan. And so you have this toolbox window and this changes window are always open. And there's two other windows over here. We have a districts and an options window and they are closed by default. But all of the layers are always turned on by default when you first open a plan. So if you were in an older plan and you were zoomed into an area and had some layers turned on and off, the application does not save those settings. So every time you reopen that plan, you're just going to have to remember where you were to zoom back into that area. So up here again, we have our language controls. And again, when you choose to switch language controls, all of the screen controls change as well. Here's the tips button. And again, this will just walk you through. It's just a couple of minutes, but it's pretty helpful. Here's the help button again. And this time when you click on help, it knows that you're looking at the plan. So right away, it takes you to how to modify the districts in the plan. And just click that help button again to get rid of that. Contact, here's the email again, the redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. We don't want you to forget that if you ever have any, any questions. We wanna make sure that you have access to reach one of us with those questions. And then we have my plans. So if I click on my plans, it's going to take me out of this plan and it's going to take me back to the plan manager. Let me show you how that works. Click on my plan. Here's my plan manager box. These two plans were already in my manager and this is the plan that I just created a few minutes ago. So I'm going to go ahead and go back into that. Click open. Brings this plan back up and you can also log out over here. After about 15 or 20 minutes of inactivity, the application, you'll see a pop-up that says, are you still working? And you can click OK or not, but it will kick you out um, if you don't respond. So moving on, we have some map tools over here. And if you just hover your mouse over any of the tools, it'll tell you exactly what that tool does. So for example, the information tool, hovering my mouse over, it says, click on the map to get location information. So I'll select that tool, click anywhere on the map, and this information dialog pops up. These are the layers that we have in the map, and it gives you some information about each of these layers, depending on where you clicked in the map. You can close that by clicking on that X, 
Next to that is your pan tool. Click and drag the mouse on the map to move it center. So you select the tool and you can move the map around. Next to that is your zoom out tool. Again, draw a rectangle on the map to zoom out. And here's your zoom in tool. Draw another rectangle on the map to zoom in. And something you'll notice as you zoom in on the map, you're gonna to start to see some labels appear. So Sunnyside, Highland, West Highland, these are all labels for our statistical neighborhoods. You'll also see these numbers that are highlighted in yellow. These numbers are the population of each of those precincts. So as you're building your districts, you can see the population of the precincts. The software takes care of the math for you, but some it, it'll be helpful to see how much population a precinct has before adding it to a district. And the more you zoom in, the more labels will appear. The closer I zoom in, the schools start to get labeled, the recreation centers and the parks, as well as the roads. If I zoom back out, you'll see those labels go away. To go back to the original extent of the map, you would just click this button, display initial map, and it takes you all the way back out to the original extent. So below that, we have another, another window. And to open and close these windows, all you have to do is click on this hamburger icon right here. And that will open or close the window. So this is called the options window. And what it really is, is your layers and your legend window. You have the ability to shrink the label size on the map, and it shrinks all of the labels on the map, as well as it shrinks your legend. I'm going to keep that at 100% for this demo. And then here's a list of all of your map layers. We have public schools, rec centers, streets, major streets, statistical neighborhoods, and this communities of interest that Emily mentioned in her presentation. We have parks. We have precincts, and these are the current precincts. These are the brand new precincts. We also have current districts on the map, and those are the districts as they exist today. And then, of course, these are the districts that you'll be building with this orange outline. Now, if you want to turn on and off some of the layers in the map, you just click the word layers. So selection layers are your precincts. So your precincts are your building blocks for your districts. So you do not have the ability to turn those off because if you turn those off, then none of your tools over here in this toolbox would work. So precincts will always remain on in the map. But you can turn on and off streets, statistical neighborhoods, all the rest of these layers. And to turn them off, you just click them. And you can see the statistical neighborhoods turned off on the map. And I can turn it back on by checking that box again. So below that, we have a districts window. So this window just has the information about each of the districts. Gives tells you that there are 11 districts in the plan. The target is to have 11 districts. We're not doing any more than 11 districts. And again, here's that ideal population or the target population of 65,047. Each district is listed over here on the left. And then you have the population for each district, the deviation, the percent deviation, and then you have a lot of race and ethnicity and voting age columns. There's about 40 columns of information in this table. So there's a lot of information. HSPLAT, that's Hispanic or Latino, NH underscore WHT would be non-Hispanic white. And because the column titles are kind of cryptic and I recognize that, I've created a field lookup table that will be available to you on the redistricting website. So you can see what each of these field and column names, how, what they translate to. You can make these columns wider. You can sort by any of the columns. You can't reorder them but you can sort by them and make them wider. I'm going to go ahead and sort by district. You can also hide some of these columns. If this is just too much information and maybe you're only interested in the voting age population 
information, which is this VA underscore pop. You go up here to show and hide columns. You select that and this box comes up. Right now, all of the columns are visible. If you want to only see the voting age population breakdown, let's move the other columns and you can select them one at a time or you can use your shift or control key to select a bunch, move them over to the hidden columns column and right away it makes that change in this table, in your districts table, as well as your pending changes table. So any columns you choose to hide will be hidden in this table and this table. I'm gonna go ahead and move these back and it puts them right back in. So moving over here to your toolbox window and your changes window. Your toolbox contains all of the tools you're going to need to draw your new districts. And the changes window will reflect all of the changes as you're drawing your districts. So let me show you what I mean. You see, this is your target. And the word target itself is green. If you hover over the drop down, this will be the district you wish to increase in size. So you can use the drop down and choose a district, or you can use this tool to click on the map to select a target district. I'm going to select District 5 because currently District 5 is negative 8.84% below the target population. So I'm going to go ahead and use this tool. Remember, I could also use the drop down and choose District 5. I'm just going to click on the map. And you'll see District 5 is now outlined in green. And again, that word target is green. And even five shows up down here under pending changes in green, just to remind you that that is your target district. And again, if you forget what that means, just hover your mouse over the drop down menu. I can zoom to that district by clicking that button, or I can go back out to the display the initial map by using this tool up here in the left. So your source. The word source is red. And if I hover my mouse over the drop down, it says this is the existing districts that you wish to select from. I think I would like to select from District 8 because currently District 8 is 12.5% above the target population. So this needs to decrease and I need to add some population to District 5. So I'm gonna go ahead and select District 8. And you can see it gets outlined in red. And then I'm going to zoom in to the boundary between District 5 and District 8. I'll use my pan tool to move over a little bit. So now I'm zoomed in, I can see that this brown area here is the East Colfax statistical neighborhood. So half of it is in District 8 and half of it, of it is in District 5. I think I wanna add the whole neighborhood to District 5. So your selection is your precincts. You don't have any other choices. Precincts are the building blocks for your districts. So you can go ahead and select a precinct by using this tool. Click on the map to select areas. And when I select a precinct, right away you start to see the pending changes box get populated. There's my district five in green and now district eight is in red. So what it's telling me is that if I add this precinct to District 5. Here's my change in population, 2,130, and you can see that that's the population on the map. And my percent deviation will change from a negative 8.84% to a negative 5.6%. So these percentages are very, very important. They will change as you modify these boundaries. Now, if you remember what Emily said, no district can be more than 10% different from one another and even ideally the district should be no more than 5% above or 5% below the target population. The application itself won't even allow you to submit a plan if any district is greater than 10%. Okay, so there are a couple things to keep in mind when you're creating your plans. So the percent deviation from the target, the districts should be contiguous and as compact as possible. And I'll get in to show you how you can check to see that these districts that you create are contiguous and compact. But paying attention 
to the percentages will be very important. So I'm also going to select this precinct to keep East Colfax statistical neighborhood altogether. So if I select these two precincts, the deviation for District 5 goes from a negative 8.84 to a negative 2.3, and District 8 goes from a 12.5% and it drops to 5.9. I'm happy with that. Then I would click this check mark. This will move all of your selected areas into the target district and update all of your districts. Think of this as your save button. So as soon as I click that, the new boundary between five and eight has been drawn on the map and this district's table will be updated with this new information. So if I change my mind and, and decide that's really not what I wanted to do, you can they, there is an undo. This will only undo the most recent change to the districts. It won't undo several changes back. So it will only undo the most recent change. If I click that, it undoes the boundary change. These remain selected, but I can clear that by clicking the X. I can also use a circle to select areas. If I draw a circle on the map, Notice it only selected these two precincts and not the ones below that because the software knows that my source is District 8. So it's only going to select precincts from District 8. You can also use this tool to draw a shape to select areas. And it's not picky, it's not fussy at all. You can just draw on the map, double click to finish, and it will select precincts that were touched by the boundaries of your shape. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK or save. And there we go. I'm gonna zoom back out. So now I can see that these numbers have changed for District 8 and District 5. So let's go over a few reports that you can run while you're in here. There's a population summary report the population summary report says that you can choose up to five additional fields. Don't tell anybody, but you can actually choose six. So you can pick up to six fields. And again, holding your control button or the shift key, you can pick six fields that you want to show up in this report. Once you select them, you move them over to the selected columns field and click OK. Here's your population summary report that breaks down by district what your plan looks like. The population of each district as it stands right now, the deviation, the percent deviation, and then here are the six fields that I chose to have in this report. In addition, there's also some summary statistics along the bottom. Next is this measure of compactness. So Emily mentioned that it, how, the importance for the districts to be compact. When you run this measure of compactness report, it's giving you the REAC measure of compactness and it broken down by district. And if you don't know what those numbers mean, that's okay. At the very bottom of the report, you'll see REAC. The measure is always between zero and one with one being the most compact. So based on this plan, I can see that 11 is not very compact, but my most compact district appears to be district five. Plan integrity. This first one is find unassigned areas. You can click on that, but it should always tell you that there are no unassigned areas. An unassigned area would be a precinct that has not been assigned to a district. And when I create the original plan for you to make a copy of and start building the districts, all of the precincts are assigned to districts already. And there's no way using the software that you can pull a precinct out of a district without assigning it to another one. So if you ever see that this has anything other than there are no unassigned areas, we need to know, but you should never see that. Find non-contiguous districts. Now, when you select that, this box will pop up and show you the non-contiguous areas in the map. So based on the geography of Denver, there are a few non-contiguous areas. What this is telling me is district six is coming up as non-contiguous in this first line is all of District 6. But the second line is telling me that because of this area, District 6 is non-contiguous. You can either double click the row to zoom and take a look at it, or you can use your zoom 
tool down here. We'll just take a look at this. Move this out of the way. And if I zoom out just a little bit, this is non-contiguous because it is physically not connected. Oops, let me go back. It is physically not connected. You can see that. So that's why it will always show up in any plan that you do as being non-contiguous. And that's OK. We can just ignore that. This area as well. You can see that this is connected, but it's connected to District 10. And on all three other sides, it's not connected to District 6. And it's really a part of District 6. So again, that's another area that can be ignored. Find, so there's a find tool in here. You can type in an address, any address, click find, and it puts a bullseye on it on the map. You can also type in a district. Where is district five? Click find, and it zooms you to district five, and again, puts the bullseye in the middle of it. Print map. So this pops up a screen and it will print exactly what is on the map in front of you. That's what you would print. And you have some options here. The layout can change. You have a few more settings you can manage on the bottom. And finally, submit plan. I'm gonna zoom all the way back out to the original extent. Just gonna go ahead and say that. So if I try to submit this plan as is, I'm going to get this message. District 9 has a deviation of 16%, which is greater than 10%. Your plan has not been submitted. So the software will not allow me to submit a plan if any district is greater than 10%. And it will bring up district one at a time. You can also see districts two and three are a negative 13%. Those would have to go under 10% for me to submit and District 11 is right at 10%. So I do have a plan that I created. So I can show you what it looks like. So all of these districts in my plan are less than, they even fell within the ideal range, which is no more than 5% above or 5% below the target population. Okay, so I could go ahead and submit this plan. And here's where the PII comes into play, the public or publicly um, available information. Up here, it asks you to provide a narrative description of the proposed plan, and we ask you to be as detailed as possible. Like I believe this is the best plan because, and then go into as much detail as you can, preferably within 250 words or less. And you can't submit the plan just by entering a little bit of information there. It will go through, it wants your first name, your last name. It wants you to fill out every, um, every field here in the screen before you can submit a plan. And once you do submit a plan, you will get an email saying that a plan has been submitted. And then we will get an email saying that you submitted a plan. We'll go through a QA, QC review process of your submitted plan, I'll be looking at things like the percent deviation from target. I will check the contiguousness of your plan and make sure it's as compact as possible. And then if your plan fails, you'll get an email from us stating why your plan failed. And if your plan passes, you'll also get an email from us saying that your plan has passed and your plan will be implemented into a dashboard that we developed to view all of the submitted and approved plans. And I wanna quickly just show you what this dashboard looks like. So here it is, City Council Redistricting Project, City and County of Denver Proposed Redistricting Plans. So this dashboard will contain all of the submitted plans that passed the criteria that I just described. You can filter each plan by whether it was publicly submitted or if it was submitted by council or you can view all of the plans. We're going to give the plan names a really generic plan name number. We're not gonna put anybody's information out there. We'll track that on the back end, but it won't be visible to everybody else. 
when you get the email saying that your plan was approved after it was submitted, I will give you this number so that you know which plan is yours. So you can come to this dashboard and look at your plan. And if you can notice when you click on any of the plans, the boundaries on the map change, as well as the graphs. So you can see the total population for this highlighted plan, for example, broken down by council district. This tab shows the percent Hispanic by district for this plan, percent white non-Hispanic, percent black non-Hispanic, and percent Asian non-Hispanic. In addition, we have these gauges down here that will show the maximum deviation over the target population and the minimum deviation under the target population, either by total or by percent. And again, it changes with each plan. We have a lot of layers that you can turn on in this dashboard as well. By default, the current precincts, the brand new precincts and the selected plan are turned on, but we also have the current city council districts. We have statistical neighborhoods, communities of interest, areas of planned growth, registered neighborhood organizations. To turn on and off layers in this map, you just click on the I. This shows the redlining grade from the homeowners loan corporation, the discriminatory practice of denying services to residents in certain areas based on their race and ethnicity. And if you click on the map, it comes up and gives you a little bit of a description of what's in that layer. We also have general and business improvement districts. And then we have 16 different layers from the DHS index. Everything from SNAP eligible, not enrolled. And I would encourage you to turn these on just one at a time um, because they do just draw on top of one another. So it's easiest to see if you draw them, turn them on one at a time. And then you can click on the map. And this gives you, for example, in Ruby Hill, 632 people are estimated eligible but not enrolled in the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So you can see all of these, there's food deserts, teen births, uninsured. Again, just turning the layer on and clicking on the map. In addition to these demographics that we have over here in the bar graphs, we have this tab of demographics. So again, as you change the plan, there's a lot more demographic information on this tab including all of the voting age breakdown by race and ethnicity as well. And so for example, this is what District 1's breakdown looks like for this plan. And you can see that there are 11 pages. So if you would like to see District 2 within this plan, District 3 and so on. And then finally, we have this instructions tab. So we want you to refer to these instructions for some guidance on how to use the dashboard. But that's all I have. Um, I hope you found this very helpful. I hope that you will all be submitting plans and um, I look forward to reviewing those. And now I can take some of your questions. Thank you very much. Great job, Kathy. Thank you so much for demoing this. And I also just wanna give you guys kudos because this dashboard was your idea. And just thanks so much for, for creating it. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. That's where we've been answering questions that have been coming up throughout the presentation as well. Um, thank you, Mary Jo Salute for your kudos. Um, but I'll just be monitoring that for a couple of minutes. I know we have a 7.30 end time, but if, I mean, Kathy did a great job. So if there aren't any questions, that's fine too. <laughs> I'd be surprised if there were none. Okay, so I have a question. Um, it's probably on the website, but what is the window for submitting plans? Um, that's a great question, Alexander. So um, because we're on such a tight timeline, um, we are only gonna be accepting plans through the month of January. So council has time to share plans out throughout the month of February. I forgot to say this in our presentation, but we have to approve our new council district boundaries by March 29th, because according to our charter, our um, 
council districts or um, you have to live in your council district for one year uh, before an election. And our next uh, election is in April, 2023. Um, so please have fun with this tool and submit a map before February because um, we would love to get your feedback and input. Um, I'm just going through the rest of these. Lots of thanks, lots of kudos. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate the support. If there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Or if you can't think of anything now, feel free to email us at redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. Um, Megan, great question. This is the only training that will take place on this tool. Um, we have recorded this, so we will be uploading this to our website. I mentioned earlier in the chat, we're redoing some things in our website now that Maptitude is up and running. So we'll have a bunch of resources on there for you all. Some FAQs, some troubleshooting tips and tricks, and as well as this um, training tutorial. Uh, I just, another person had questions. Um, Paula had a question about um, browsers, and I just want to highlight Chrome is the best browser for Maptitude. Uh, so try not to use Explorer. Uh, where can we find more information about community meetings? Great question, Shannon. Um, we will be posting those on our redistricting website. I can tell you the dates and the times, but we're still working on locations. We're coordinating with DPS um, for locations throughout the city, um, but those uh, will be taking place Wednesday, February, let me pull up my calendar, February 2nd, February 9th, February 16th, February 23rd, and March 2nd. We will also be having a virtual one on Saturday, February 12th as well. Um, yes, Joel, I addressed uh, the question in the Q&A box. Uh, that was an issue with technology services, so I put in a ticket, and hopefully that data will be updated. I'm not sure what happened, but thanks for pointing that out. So if anyone also sees issues or errors, please do feel free to email us again at redistricting2022 at denvergov.org, um, and we will fix those issues. And yes, Leslie, the January 10th meeting will be available to the public. The Zoom link to that is on our main city council webpage, um, where you go, if you scroll down, you'll see all the Zoom links for all the committee meetings. So register for that and Zoom will uh, put that on your calendar. Um, Shannon had a question about the meetings in February. Yes, so the meetings in February will be facilitated by an independent facilitator. Uh, and so they're gonna have the final maps that council members decide throughout January uh, to share out with the public. And it'll kind of be, it'll be an opportunity for people to provide input on the maps, uh, to say what they like about the maps, what they don't like about the maps. And then every week, the facilitator will be coming back to committee and reporting out on the results of the meeting and um, we'll be tweaking, you know, um, maps based on that input. Um, Catherine has a great question. Um, do I understand that we must map the entire city and not just the area where we are familiar with communities of interest? That is correct. So Maptitude is focusing on citywide council district boundaries, representable, just focused on your community of interest. So we're going to be looking at the city holistically. And I can't emphasize this enough, please use Maptitude as your tool. There's a ton of other great redistricting tools out there, um, but it just would make it easier for us in our analysis of criteria if you use this tool. Um, John says, if our city council doesn't like our map, it will never be distributed for others to see. Um, so if your map meets all the criteria, it will be on this dashboard. So everybody will be able to see your map. Um, I think the intent behind this exercise is very similar to the state's independent redistricting commissions methods where they had the public submit maps. And fun fact, the Senate map for the state was a publicly submitted map that the commission then used and tweaked based on public comments. So maybe a map that the public submits could inspire 
a reason for changing another boundary or what have you. Um, Megan has a great question about process. Will council members get to choose which maps move forward? Yes, so redistricting is a council led process. And so they will deliberate amongst the 13 of them as to which maps um, are most favorable and desired and will move forward. Um, Mary Jo has a great question. If we can't attend a meeting, will the results or recap of the meeting be available for review? Yes, so our facilitator will be reporting back each week uh, in the redistricting committee on Mondays at 1.30 p.m., which you can view on channel eight or on Zoom, um, and they will be sharing out the results of those uh, community meetings. Um, Kayla has a great question just on, are all maps created equal? I don't really know if I can answer that question. Um, I guess we're, I really don't, that's a great question um, because there's innate power dynamics going on. Um, but I would just encourage you all to use this tool to um, one, familiarize yourself with the tools council is using as they go through this process as well and to help inform conversations you have with your council members um, to advocate for where you think those boundaries should lie uh, because these boundaries will be in effect for 10 years. Um, correct, Shannon, there is no commission like there is at the state level. And that's the end of the questions. Are there any more technical questions for Doug or Kathy? Okay, I don't hear any or see any in the chat. Um, so we'll just end, oh. Katie said she got logged out pretty quickly. Can you extend the active time in Maptitude? In Maptitude? She got logged out in Maptitude. We'll look into it. I, I don't think that is a setting we can change, but we will definitely look into that. Okay. She said, thank you. Um, is there, Juan has a good question about processes. So is there a way to change redistricting like there was for the state? Um, as I said before, at the beginning of the presentation, redistricting is outlined in our charter. Uh, so you could, um, if anyone wanted to change how redistricting happens, uh, you would have to run a ballot initiative and a charter change. Um, and so that would be how that would uh, change how Denver City Council does redistricting. Um, but I will say Austin has an independent redistricting commission, so it's not unheard of at the municipal level. Uh, sounds like there's some activation going on in the chat now. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, I am going to say there aren't any. Um, oh, sounds like someone's, that's not a question. Um, <laughs> all right, great. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time. Uh, if you have, again, uh, questions you want that come up as you're using the software, feel free to email us at redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. Oh, I see one more question. Um, Joel says, Joel Noble wrote, uh, last redistricting council tried hard to keep statistical neighborhoods together uh, as much as possible. Is there a similar commitment this time? That's a great question. So in September, city council passed it's resolution outlining principles and procedure. And um, one of the um, sections in that uh, commitment to council made was to try and preserve statistical neighborhoods and colloquial neighborhoods to the greatest extent possible. Um, because as you know, some statistical neighborhoods um, house multiple smaller neighborhoods inside of them, like Five Points, for example. Um, we will be reviewing that resolution in the Monday uh, redistricting committee meeting, just so everybody has it fresh in their minds as they start drawing their maps. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming tonight. And uh, a special thanks again for Kathy and Doug. And thank you, Sam, for uh, providing interpretation as well. Uh, we will be uploading this recording, uh, hopefully in a couple of days, 
Um, but again, if you have questions, email us at redistricting2022 at denvergov.org. Thank you.